welcome to the Keat Shelley podcast. My name is James Kidd. My guest in today's episode is the poet, biographer and critic Fiona Sampson, who's discussing her favourite poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley, The Hymn to Intellectual Beauty. Fiona is perhaps the ideal person to explore the literary, philosophical and biographical aspects of this most famous poem. For one thing, she is the chair of 2022's Keat Shelley and Young Romantics Prizes, which this year have commemorated the bicentenary of Percy Bysshe Shelley's death in Italy. Fiona has written 29 books to date, mixing volumes of poetry with criticism and biography. Recurring themes and interests include music, health, feminism and place, all of which informed a highly praised biography of Mary Shelley, the girl who wrote Frankenstein. Seven years before, Fiona had edited an edition of Percy Bysshe Shelley's poems as part of Faber and Faber's Poet to Poet series. Her latest book, Starlit Wood, follows in the footsteps of several romantic writers, painters, philosophers and composers, including Percy Bysshe Shelley, to explore how they were influenced and formed by the rural world around them. It seems especially apt that that title, Starlit Wood, is taken directly from the hint to intellectual beauty. Our conversation began with Fiona reading the poem itself. Hymn to Intellectual Beauty The awful shadow of some unseen power floats through unseen among us, visiting this various world with as inconstant wing as summer winds that creep from flower to flower. Like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shower, it visits with inconstant glance each human heart and countenance. Like hues and harmonies of evening, like clouds in starlight widely spread, like memory of music fled, like aught that for its grace may be dear, and yet dearer for its mystery. Spirit of beauty, that doth consecrate with thine own hues all thou dost shine upon of human thought or form, where art thou gone? Why dost thou pass away and leave our state this dim vast veil of tears, vacant and desolate? Ask why the sunlight not for ever weaves rainbows o'er yon mountain river, why aught should fail and fade that once is shown, why fear and dream and death and birth cast on the daylight of this earth such gloom, why man has such a scope for love and hate, despondency and hope. No voice from some sublimer world hath ever to sage or poet these responses given. Therefore the names of demon, ghost and heaven remain the records of their vain endeavour. Frail spells, whose utter charm might not avail to sever from all we hear and all we see, doubt, chance and mutability. Thy light alone, like mist o'er mountains driven, or music by the night wind sent through strings of some still instrument, or moonlight on a midnight stream gives grace and truth to life's unquiet dream. Love, hope and self-esteem, like clouds depart and come for some uncertain moments lent. Man were immortal and omnipotent, didst thou, unknown and awful as thou art, keep with thy glorious train firm state within his heart. Thou messenger of sympathies that wax and wane in lovers' eyes, thou that to human thought a nourishment like darkness to a dying flame. Depart not as thy shadow came, depart not, lest the grave should be like life and fear, a dark reality. While yet a boy, I sought for ghosts and sped through many a listening chamber, cave and ruin and starlight wood, with fearful steps pursuing hopes of high talk with the departed dead. I called on poisonous names with which our youth is fed. I was not heard. I saw them not, when musing deeply on the lot of life at that sweet time when winds are wooing all vital things that wake to bring news of buds and blossoming, sudden thy shadow fell on me. I shrieked and clasped my hands in ecstasy. I vowed that I would dedicate my powers to thee and thine. Have I not kept the vow? With beating heart and streaming eyes, even now I call the phantoms of a thousand hours, each from his voiceless grave. They have, in visioned bowers of studious zeal or love's delight, outwatched with me the envious night. 
They know that never joy illumed my brow, unlinked with hope that thou wouldst free this world from its dark slavery, that thou, O awful loveliness, wouldst give whate'er these words cannot express. The day becomes more solemn and serene when noon is past. There is a harmony in autumn and a lustre in its sky, which through the summer is not heard or seen, as if it could not be, as if it had not been. Thus let thy power, which like the truth of nature on my passive youth descended, to my onward life supply its calm, to one who worships thee, and every form containing thee, whom, spirit fair, thy spells did bind to fear himself and love all humankind. Thank you very much. It's one. It was wonderful to hear a, a poet re, read poetry. It's, it sounds stupid, but how, how how does it feel to to read that poem? Mm. Yeah, I mean, when I'm teaching poetry, I, I mean, when I'm teaching the writing of poetry too, I'm always encouraging people to read out loud in their own head if they can't read out loud out loud. In poetry, is an oral form, spelt both ways, isn't it? But <laughs> what I noticed when I was reading that just now is how Shakespearean it is, how the enjambments, how the movement of the thought across the lines is exactly like I could. Tr- I was trying to stop my intonation becoming. RSC-ish, you know. I went to see um, an outdoor Shakespeare last week. You know, the way the lines move, that the way they sit back on pentameter is so... Well, it's so good to speak. It so fits with the human voice. Well, well, the human voice in English, it so fits with the rhythm of the language, the demotic language, um, the conversational language. It's, it's quite surprising because when you look at Shelley on the page, I think, one of the first things you notice is that it looks counterintuitive. It, it's al- it almost always transaic. He uses a lot of M dashes, the, the Emily Dickinson dash, rather than the normal N dash that we use nowadays. And so it looks archaic. He capitalizes the starts of lines and he indents lines. These are all 19th century conventions and they all actually show the movement of the words and the thought and the sound of the poem down the page, they score it like a musical score. But the experience of reading is counterintuitive because you read through that apparatus to this kind of conversational moving, moving along voice. You compare, compare it to a sort of Shakespearean performance. For this poem, is it important that it, it feels almost like a, a speech? I mean, it's, called a, it's called a hymn. It, it, it seems to be begs to be, to be sung. I mean, a Shelleyan hymn perhaps, but... Is, is that is that a part of the effect of this poem that it needs to be performed and, and therefore perhaps to, to some kind of audience? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's definitely evocative, isn't it? A hymn is, I mean, the title is is telling you to at least do it out loud, I think. He could have called it an ode. He didn't. He <laughs> called it a hymn. And, and there's something strange about that because um, an ode is a more, potentially a more private confession, whereas a hymn suggests something collective. But this is very first personal. I mean, I would say that that's quite characteristic of Shelley, that for Shelley, there's often this this conflation of the poem's narrative self with the world or the idea that he's addressing. It's a strange take on the omniscient narrator. I mean, if you think of the Ode to the West Wind, he's saying that I too, O West Wind, have had strong, turbulent feelings. And you want to say, well, Percy, you are a great deal smaller than the West Wind, (laughs) which was rushing through the Cascan woods, you know, in Florence as you started writing this poem. There is something boundaryless and a little bit hubristic about the Shelleyan poetic persona. And I think that that's something you either adore or are endlessly exasperated by and I've alternated between the two you know when I was a kid I fell into the Ode to the West Wind I I think it was in a children's novel it was quote little bits were quoted and so I went away and read the poem and thought this was tremendously exciting and so on because there's something very I think there's something which appeals to the solecism of a child at the solecism and the solipsism of child that you are you, you are quite boundaryless and you don't have any problems appreciating uh, a poetics which is 
embracing a sense that the world is everything that you can perceive and not much beyond that, for example, at its least. (laughs) Also, it is wonderful out loud poetry. It is very energetic. And I think that both those things come from this sense or that Shelley had of himself as a poet of revolution, but also actually it's something prior to that. It's actually almost his unconscious motivation, I think that he was absolutely taken by the moment of change. He had problems with stuckness. He had problems with form. He had problems, one could say, with commitment. The biographical (laughs) part of myself would say, the biographer in me would say, Percy Bashelli had problems with commitment. But he was also, you know, a schoolboy chemist. He was... um, politically a revolutionary against, you know, many traditional forms from marriage to established religion, well, religion at all, to the political systems of his day. And um, one is not perhaps quite sure what he proposed to put in their place, but that's perhaps something we can put in brackets. So there is, and there is in his best poetry, this kind of celerity, this kind of running away downhillness of the poem poem remains beautifully controlled, but it's got this tremendous momentum. A few years ago, I was asked to prepare an edition of Shelley in the Poet to Poet series for Faber. And I think that that's quite significant because I was asked not as a scholar, but as a poet, like as as your question asks. I was quite resistant because my feeling about Shelley then was too many words. (laughs) There is so much verbiage. But of course, some of that verbiage is, in fact, all of it is, is this attempt to capture the onrushingness, the not now, but now, but now, but now, but nowness of life. I mean, you know, Heraclitus would put it differently, and perhaps with fewer words, you know, when he said you can't step into the same river twice. But there, there is um, a sense of flux or a sense of the necessity of flux in Shelley, which I think must have made him absolutely appalling to live with, but <laughs> is extraordinarily exciting in the out loudness of his verse. Is there also just a sheer exhilarating thrill? I mean, like when you were talking just then, it made me think also of that, I, don't, I think I don't know if it's apocryphal or true, that the, the critique offered to Mozart of I enjoyed your opera, but absolutely, it's got yeah. too many too many notes. Too many notes, and, yes. And that Mozart can't, but can't stop himself in the way that I think probably Charlie Parker couldn't stop himself. I always feel that with Shelley that I wonder sometimes if you thought, right, I'm going to write a poem and it's going to be it's going to be a nice clipped, perhaps just 12 lines. And then he looks at the end of it and it's Epipsychidion or something. The, the, but there's a sort of thrill of being a poet. Uh, uh, yes, you, absolutely. Do you, do you feel that? I think you, were... you hear it in the poems, yes. But But I also think, I mean, this is a good example, isn't it? This is a poem which, you know, famously, when Shelley sent it off for publication to his friend Lee Hunt, Lee, Lee Hunt lost it. So Shelley wrote it out again. Shelley, aided by Mary Shelley, wrote it out again. Yes. That tremendous facility. And the other thing, of course, as Mary Shelley's biographer, the other thing I think about a lot with Shelley is how untidy his drafts were. And that suggests speed in the process, this kind of momentum, this unstoppability. I mean, crossings out and so on. So not heedless, not you know, he's making a poem, he's making as good as he possibly can, but a kind of urgency in the whole process. There's something very inspiring and exciting about that, the sense of, particularly when you are starting writing, but to be honest, it doesn't ever really go away. You're in love with it. There's a sense of unstoppability and you want there to be a sense of unstoppability, which is, I think, where the myth of writer's block comes from. Writer's block, of course, is it's a spectre. It's not. It's not a reality. It's uh, ask any writer who doesn't have enough time to write. There is no such thing as writer's block. But but there are days of ease and and fluency, and there are days of hard work and kind of something more lapidary. I think Shelley had quite. On the one hand, mm. there's this obviously tremendous gift too. It's a tremendous facility. He was obviously very charming. He was able to make lots of people dance to his tune, not just women. Um, you know, when he met Byron the summer that he wrote this poem, 1816, you know, he goes and he he rents very close to Byron on the shore of Lake Geneva. And Byron is much, much more famous and distinguished than Shelley at this point. I mean, Byron is, you know, a kind of rock star. I mean, really famous. <laughs> and in terms of the aristocracy, he's also posher. He's grander 
than Shelley. So everything that Shelley has in his kind of quiver of, you know, his armory of, to say that he's important, actually, Byron has massively more so. And, and yet Byron, until he gets bored of him by the end of the summer, has quite a lot of time for Shelley. Shelley manages to convince him of his own significance, of the importance of his vegetarianism. You know, he gets Byron to go take him sailing. He, he inveigles his way in with Byron. I mean, I don't mean that Byron was, you know, not necessary, you know, not a, a poet given to gregariousness. He was a poet given to gregariousness. But still, mm. you know, Shelley manages. So Shelley's also a person of great charm, hugely gifted. And he, and so there's all this all these things that are easy. And he's got family money, which is what, of course, allows him to be a writer in the first place. And he's had a great education, even if he was sent down from Oxford for advocating atheism. We're so, and we absorb that version of him, and we forget the intensity of his self invention and the extent to which actually he comes from Sussex County gentry. He's supposed to be a country gentleman, you know, living in his country house and riding to hounds and, you know, having roast beef for dinner. And, and he isn't doing those things. And he can only be not doing those things, either if he carries on being a political activist, which he's stopped doing by the time he's met Mary Shelley, because almost the last stage of his political activism is when he's going to Mary's father, William Godwin, the philosopher who inspired him, for money, for um, a kind of ideal community he's trying to, to build in Wales, and near Porth Malloch, or the licence for his specialness is his poetry. That puts a kind of lot of pressure on the poetry, to be amazing, to be kind of the hand of God in a Maradona-ish sense, to kind of alight upon him and be unforced and unworked and be kind of excel, be more than anybody else around him could possibly be writing. One of the things I always think about the triumph of life, the great long poem that he f- left unfinished when he drowned. Of course, he's drowning. He's not quite 30. He's not quite had his 30th birthday. Mm-hmm but he drowns at some of his birthdays on August birthday, is that it's quite grinding. It's not particularly fluent. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's his version of the Divine Comedy and it's not nearly on the same scale. Okay, partly because he died in the middle, but it's not shaping up to be. It's not, he's not building those whole structures that Dante was building. It's, it's a kind of shrunken version of... You know, as if this is what he could manage. And also, of course, like many of the romantics, he's experimenting with drugs, he's experimenting with hallucinogens. You know, there are various set pieces of his life where he, you know, he's undergoing hallucinations and so on. And there too, there's a tremendous sense of having to keep it revved up all the time. That anxiety, which is the 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 other side of the coin of the the glorious flight. And I think that that's in this poem too, isn't it? Because intellectual beauty is, it's the great truth, the great touchstone truth, but it's also numinous and fleeting and the mists have to part. And his relationship with it is not stable in the poem. It's not only not stable narratively, like he has a flashback to when he was young and going for what we might call book learning and and then realising that's not the way, those are the poisonous names with which our youth is fed, you know, and that, you know, no authentic realisation is the thing. Intellectual beauty is authentic realisation. And so now he's realised that authentic realisation. <laughs> but it's also, un- so it's unstable chronologically, but it's also unstable in what actually he really thinks intellectual beauty is. Well, actually, that's a very good question. That what What is intellectual beauty? It's a slightly sort of forbidding phrase in as much as I think using the word intellectual seems to, to have people running for, mm. for the hills these days. Um, it seems to be the worst thing you could could possibly be courtesy yes. of, of our political leaders. But is, is that a place to, to start? Where, where would you... Yes, I think you're right. I think we do enter it via the title, don't we? And it's strange for our modern ear to hear him and intellectual in the same phrase. Mm. Though him to intellectual beauty feels counterintuitive. And intellectual beauty feels moderately counterintuitive, but there is a one has a kind of trace memory of, you know, a beautiful mind, the film about, you know, the sense of a kind of genius that comes close to mathematical purity and the kind of Pythagorean music of the spheres of that kind of beauty of perfect truth. And I think that intellectual beauty is 
is the beautiful mind. I mean, he isn't using intellectual in the in that debased contemporary term meaning too well educated or too cerebral. He's simply meaning thought, understood, a mental experience. I think what's really touching about this poem for me is that he starts with it as some unseen power and he ends with a spirit fair who binds him to fear himself and love all humankind Mm. and that same occult force that's to say literally hidden force is for him intellectual beauty and actually intellectual beauty is simply truth which kind of happens is both imminent in the world and happens in the moment of apprehension the moment where you get it the aha moment Mm. so it's it's such a paradox this poem because here it is seven stanzas i mean it's a long poem but really what it's talking about is the aha that very short that instant where it goes the light bulb moment where you get it and what it is can sometimes not quite be put into words. You know, in other traditions, they talk about the koan, don't they? The Where you're set up to fall into apprehension, to fall into getting it. Oh, ching. oh, right, there it is. Another way to talk about it is a thought experiment. A awful loveliness would, would give whatever these words cannot express. And it seems to be one of the, the real challenges of for a poet, and as you were saying, uh, when you were just drawing our attention to this idea of, of things that are unseen and just in case we haven't got it Shelley repeats unseen in the first twice in the first two lines and yet how do we put this into language exactly is that, is, this seems to be one of the things that, that we find difficult about, about Shelley I think it absolutely is and I think he's in, in a sense he's almost a postmodernist because he's coming up against the problem of language failing to be to be the thing that it's about language is simply scaffolding that is empty of the living world and yet he wants it to be a full word he wants to be it to be full of the word to be full of the world and i think that's one of the reasons for the oscillation because if you hear what the un- unseen sounds against the awful so the poem starts mm. the awful shadow of some unseen so the n- unseen power floats through unseen among us, visiting this various world with as inconstant wing as summer winds that creep from flower to flower. There are all these ends that he nubs up against in those mm. first floor lines. And then this fabulous, where behind becomes a verb, like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shout and piney mountain moonbeams. It visits with inconstant glance each human heart and countenance. The language is, it's alliteration crudely, the language is knitting itself together orally, but it's sort of knitting itself around the truth that it still can't quite hold. I suppose it's net, trying to net the truth, isn't it? The second half of the stanza just opens out again, doesn't it? So you get human heart and kind of, so you begin to get the breath in. And then it becomes much more breathy with this list, with the opening out of the M dashes at the end of each line. So each human heart and countenance, like hues and harmonies, so again, HH, of evening, like clouds and starlight widely spread, like memory of music fled, like aught that for its grace may be dear and yet dearer for its mystery. So he brings us to the the preciousness and the mystery that his poem has just shepherded us through. I, I, I like the likes because it reminds me of what you were saying earlier, that the rush, it's, it's Shelley almost... Here's, here's one thing it's like, but it's also like this. It's also like this. And all those things are true, but it's as though each time he he's getting closer, yes. getting further away, <laughs> getting closer, getting further away, all at the same time. It's a sort of... Um, yes, it's a, absolutely. He's like sort of slightly... Lawrence in his poetry, isn't he? <laughs> Lawrence in his poetry is, is always having another go. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I mean, it's, it's slightly, it's incredibly exciting, beautiful and slightly maddening as well, all at the same time and you feel that maybe he's feeling that too how do I describe this isn't there some perfect combination of words that I can just put this in into yes because of course he has another go at the the music with the the stringed instrument with the aeolian harp in the third stanza that it gets you know he tries again so thy light alone here we come again like 
Mist or mountains driven, or music by the night wind sent through strings of some still, still instrument, or moonlight on a midnight stream gives grace and truth to life's unquiet dream. The or is a bit of a cheap trick, I think. There, <laughs> you know, yeah, you're not quite as in control as you think you are, Shelley. But I like that because I like it's, the... it's also one of the. So I was just going to say, with moonlight on a midnight stream, so it's reflections of reflected light for it's this. The, the moon's reflecting the sun's light. The, the moon is reflected on the water. It's this sort of, it's, I don't know if this is one of these sort of platonic moments of, of layers of reality, but it's, you, you can't, you put your hand in the water and the moon disappears. It's like a sort of children's story. <laughs> yes. That my daughter loves. Well, um, it also, it's, it's all about it's, something that is not the causal thing, isn't it? The wind is what makes yeah. the instrument sound and the moonlight is what makes the stream shine and the the wind is what makes the mist or, you know, and it's like he's doing the mirror and the lamp and he's struggling with, you know, what it is that poetry actually does. Which is it? I think that's one of the things I, I absolutely love about Shelley, that the closer in you get to him, you realise how many ideas are packed in. You think at first reading, you read it and you love it and it's a wonderful oral experience and it's a great gallop. And, and you think, uh, well, the diction is a little bit old fashioned, but I can get past that. And oh, there's a there's a there's a person speaking behind this and or through this. But as you get closer, you realize that actually his ideas are really quite sophisticated, and he's having them for the first time. You know, he is the first person to be thinking these things, and that, of course, is one of the things that I think is very exciting and also frustrating about Romanticism. First of all, that so much of it has become incorporated in our culture for example the idea of the picturesque or the nation state and democratic self-determination i mean you know sort of rousseauian ideas it feels cliched and over familiar and sort of so whatish but then there is also the the way in which because these are the first times these ideas have been explored in western culture in western thought not necessarily in other cultures they may already have been explored but the exploration is often in a way, a little bit deprecating. It's quite, well, at least it's informal. It hasn't become kind of prevent, professionalized as philosophy. Not obviously that there weren't romantic philosophers, and Coleridge was obviously the bridge for German idealism coming into Britain and into English. But when the poets have ideas, the lyric voice or style kind of trumps the, in fact, intellectual content. This is one, as you're saying, this is one of those sorts of ideas that is so hard to put your finger on. That they're, they're, it's all through Keats about the limits of consecutive reasoning and negative capability. That there's a, I feel this, I can't quite put this to you in a sort of nice postcard length, um, or I can put this in a tweet, but a poem can do this. And it's, sometimes it's almost like the gaps between the words or the lines, or it's going to be, in the, as you were saying, the, the nuance in the sounds. This poem is full of things that are. You know, you've you've put your hand on it, but it's 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 melted the uh, mm. away. Or is that where poetry can kind of come in? Absolutely, I think it absolutely is. I mean, I do not agree with the kind of notion that was around in the nineties that critical theorists are the poets of our day, because obviously I'm a poet, and some of my best friends are poets. So I think <laughs> poetry is still doing its slippery, extending the boundaries thing. It's still reading the inarticulate, and the inarticulate may shift. But still, the point is the raiding. But I do think it's striking when you read the major romantics, how much of, let's say, what their poems are doing comes back again with late 20th century continental philosophy. It's Ellen Sisu who talks about strategies of celerity. It's Derrida's the heir of, you know, Nietzsche and Heidegger. I mean, many uh, 20th century philosophers sort of after Hegel, school of Hegel as it were, that talk about the kind of contingency of language and the way it will always fail. You know, it's the Beckett try again, fail again, fail better, isn't it? But, you know, what's a little bit earlier than the Romantics? Pope. I mean, nothing could be more different. You know, that kind of wry certainty, that realist contract with ontology with the nature of being you know 
I can write in a poem, I don't know, the I know a tree that grows a slant of brook. I mean, I've seen Shakespeare and not uh, Pope, but, you know, and and that's fine. There is a tree and there is a brook and the, and the tree is probably a weeping, weeping willow because it's growing crookedly. I mean, once you get to Shelley, that's not the case. And And I do think that this poem is in a way Shelley's version of, you know, a poem which I absolutely love, which is Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn. You know, this is his beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that there's a kind of truth is a kind of ideal entity. And I think the great irony is that other thinkers and other cultures and other cultural moments would simply have that placeholder be God. What's ironic about that is that Shelley has paid such a high price for his atheism and he's so proud of his atheism and, and yet there is an absolute, it is imminent because it's not, I mean, there are lots of likes, there are lots of metaphorical mountains, but there is also an unseen power in things. And of course, the sister poem to this is Mont Blanc, lines written in the Vale of Chamonix, written in the same summer of 1816, and also talking about the naked countenance of earth, the kind of, now you really see it. Those moments where imminence, the kind of, the isness of what you're looking at really seems to kind of come clear to you. That isn't necessarily a religious experience, obviously, but Shelley doesn't want it to just be a life-enriching thing. He wants it to be something he can hold on to. He wants it to be truth. And that desire for revelation to be truth is a desire for revelatory religion, in fact. Um, and, I mean, I wonder, you know, if he hadn't drowned, if he had lived to middle age, what where he would have gone with that. I mean, one completely can't know, of course. And, of course, strategies of celerity, let's remind ourselves that he drowned because he was obsessed by speed. If he hadn't modified his boat and then sailed without testing it, and also if he hadn't been impatient to get home, despite the fact that he knew a summer storm was coming up, he wouldn't have drowned. Or not that day, anyway. I, know, I, was, I was just thinking, actually, when you mentioned more. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that I, when you were just talking about Mont Blanc and it's... One of the things I really like about Shelley, but also find really incredibly hard, is that so Mont Blanc, which begins, uh, the everlasting universe of things flows through the mind and rolls its rapid waves, now dark, now glittering, now reflecting gloom, now lending, I'm just getting it out of breath reading it, now lending splendour, where from secret springs the source of human thought, its tribute brings it. And as you say, there's there's a truth in the mountain, but it's also going on in its head, and then you get this kind of we were talking earlier about the feedback loop that you get sometimes with these recordings, but it's what's going on inside Shelley's mind is a bit like the mountain, but the mountain's like Shelley's, and you get this sort of, it goes round and round, and you can see how he spins off. I was wondering, mm. with, with, with these two poems, and perhaps asking you with your biographer's hat on, what was happening mm. with Shelley that's, that summer, this, this sort of famous summer which produced uh, Frankenstein? Um, is there a biographical way to, to approach this poem? Yes. You were saying think, that these poems spring out of something. I think I think it's I think that's a great question. And I think there is, and certainly the two poems together, Mont Blanc and the hymn. As you rightly say, so this is the summer of eighteen sixteen, which is the year without a summer, because volcanic ash from an eruption in what was then the Dutch East Indies has really blocked out the sun over much of the northern hemisphere. So there's still frost in high summer and people are starving. I mean, in Britain, they're not doing very well anyway because people are already starving because of the Corn Laws. So there's there are there's unrest. People are desperate, and Byron has to leave Britain because of scandal around his divorce, and so he goes into exile and never returns to Britain. And he goes to Geneva, and Claire Clermont, who is Mary Shelley's stepsister and whom I personally believe, though I can't absolutely prove it, but, you know, reading the material, I become more and more convinced, had already had an affair with and a child by Percy, you know, recovers from, returns from a mysterious period of recuperation, whatever I would suggest, maternity on the North Devon coast and kind of throws her cap at Byron. She's going to have a poet for herself because, of course, Percy is with Mary, not yet Shelley. Mary Godwin. So Claire Clermont has not really got anything going with Byron. I mean, crudely, they slept together once. And she, on the basis of this, weirdly managed to persuade both Mary and Percy Bysshe that they would really like Byron and that they, you know, they they all should hang out together. And so says them, why don't we go for the summer, 
to Geneva. Why don't we follow Byron to Geneva? It's a kind of very desperate and strange and stretched thing. But they do, and um, it works well. I mean, the gamble works. But then Claire falls pregnant by Byron. And Percy knows this, and he knows it before Mary does. And I think he already knows it when the three of them, so Percy, Mary, and Claire, but not Byron or Polidori, who is Byron's doctor, and he's accompanying him on this trip in order to write a sort of kiss-and-tell memoir, not kiss, but tell memoir, uh, for John Murray's The Three... Of, the, of Shelley's household, because you have to remember that Claire, apart from when she went off on this mysterious period to North Devon, lives with M- Mary and Percy and has done for the whole of their relationship. Go to go to Mont Blanc, they go up and they go to the mayor, they cross the mayor de glace and, and they make two attempts in three days. They can't get up the first time. They're, they're quite organised, they've got a donkey and so on, but then the donkey can't go any further because it's all sort of boulders. And the mayor de glace becomes the great set piece at the heart of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's across the Mare de Glass that the creature comes to challenge his creator and say, you've created me unlovable, and to replicate the biblical passage which Mary has in as the epigraph to her novel where Adam says to God, you threw me out of paradise for a fault which you created in me. And for that moment, that encounter, which is the heart of the, the you know, the Russian doll, three Russian doll novels. So the first time they can't get up the top and it's coming down, Shelley slips and faints, uh, twists his knee, but they make it on the second ascent. You know, one of the party has a twisted knee and one of the party is pregnant. And the third of the party has a teething toddler back home in Geneva. So it's quite a fraught, you know, a fraught thing. And it's also, of course, an ascent that's happening in really wintry conditions, because this is a year without a summer. And, you know, Mary's letters home and so on are full of, oh, it's so interesting and, you know, um, the peasants do this, that and the other. All around them, people are starving. So it's a really strange, in a bubble kind of psyche. And then they go back to Villa Diodati, where famously, of course, there are discussions about whether life is just life without God, after the death of God, is just a series of kind of electrical impulses, and therefore one could make that happen anyway. So there are a lot of questions about what life is. And Percy, I think, has lost his girlfriend. I mean, he's lost his triangulation point, which allows him to not have to fully commit to Mary. And he is has befriended Byron, but Byron has grown wearisome. You know, his kind of crank ideas are too much for Byron. And the summer ends sort of sooner than the Shelley household had really expected, and they go back to London, not exactly with their tail between their legs, but, you know, not in great humour. But it's during that summer that Percy writes both those poems. And then the following year, sends to Lee Hunt to publish, well, sends in 1816, but then Lee Hunt actually publishes in January, January 1817. So, so they come out of something which is kind of actually quite fraught and fractious and quite human, and one of the things I, with my biographer's hat on, I always think is funny about him to intellectual beauty is that it's all in the first person singular, but actually Percy didn't go by himself. He went with the two people he was closest to who had resp- responses of their own, which come to us down to us in Frankenstein. So for all that he's searching for truth, there's quite a lot of false consciousness going on at the same time. I'm also just interested in that one stanza Stanza five, and it's obviously been remarked on a lot, but where you get this sudden bit of autobiography, um, Shelley at school, and, and before at Field Place, where he's experimenting in all sorts of slightly strange scientific, mm. um, including allegedly connecting kites to cats and uh, enduring the midst of storms, but also uh, various occult um, ceremonies that I think both frightened and excited his sisters and going to Matthew Monk Lewis and, and all sorts of things and starting to write mm. poetry. It's a, sort of, it's a very striking moment of placing both something quite biographical in, in the midst of this numinous, diaphanous meditation and also this moment of returning to, to childhood. It's a double... And then you get this idea of, in the beginning of, of stanza six, have I not kept the vow? Yes. I was, I was wondering what you... Yes. Both as a biographer, but also just reading the poem. I think that's right. And I think... Obviously, I think that's right. And I think that you're saying something... Of course, you're reminding me that also, of course, those same two things come together, science and sort of necromancy in, in the Villa Diodati, because, of course, they also read the Phantasmagoriana, so they read these horror stories. And then Shelley shrieks and has this hallucination that he thinks Mary's nipples are eyes, 
which <laughs> is if I was Mary, I would have been so, I would have wanted to box his ears. I mean, you know, also a, so, a line straight out of Christabel, a kind of the early version of Christabel. So it's, it's not even his own image. And <laughs> it's Mary who will have shared that image with him, who will have shared that version of Christabel with him. So it's a real, oh, passive aggressive kind of, well, quite aggressive actually, but you know, <laughs> stealing of intellectual, again, the thunder of his partners, a sort of cultural knowledge. I think it obviously is directly autobiographical, but I also think that it's capacious. It's got space for, you know, any of us to sort of think back and think whether, you know, you're 21 and you're thinking back to when you were 13 in school or whether you're 25 and you're thinking back to when you were 20 and an undergraduate or whatever, to think back to that sense of here's the canon. This is what you've got to read. This is what you've got to be like. Each of it's a kind of actually a different kind of canon, which is the kind of, personal taste of that tutor or that classroom teacher or it's a national curriculum or whatever that sense of this is what you're fed and you're almost force fed it and you know the siren call of the romantics is to go and find for yourself not only through necromancy not necessarily literally through necromancy but through the works of the dead you know on your bookshelves and but also the works of living writers now I mean there is a there is a broader way to read it as which is what's powerful because it's not just a bit of kind of private, you know, his personal history as, you know, that kind of when you're looking, you're searching, you're searching for truth and, and everything isn't quite it, doesn't give you the answers and you haven't yet found where to look or, or you haven't found the answers. I mean, of course, one doesn't, but, you know, I think it's very powerful because it works just, it works both in an autobiographical way and it works in a more general way. I think, you know, he's talking about, you know, that sweet time when all vital things that wait to bring news of blood, buds and blossoming, you know, when he's sort of saying, when I should have been, you know, young and idealistic, I was cramped by, in his case, of course, doing the classics. I was, mm. because that's what he would have had, won't he? A classical education at Eton. So again, it's a kind of organic, natural world metaphor of the intellect of something burgeoning and being cramped down and sort of being bonsai as it were, and which is part of that same thing you were talking about, about the lack of boundary between himself and the world of his, his environment, the world around him. Thank you for listening to the Keat Shelley podcast. This podcast is hosted by James Kidd. The music is Androids Always Escape by Chris Zabriskie. Visit chriszabriskie.com. You can hear more episodes and also subscribe to the podcast by visiting our homepage, Keat Shelley podbean.com You can support the Keat Shelley House by becoming a friend of the Keat Shelley Memorial Association. Visit keatshelley.org and click support us.